people who understand how money works in this world have an idea of how God's kingdom works. That's what we're told. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemper. And I'm Janice. And this program is called Quick Study Television, a television program that is designed to take you through the Bible in one year. Corey is here. What are you doing, Corey? I'm going to be taking a look at the supposed tomb of Herod the Great. Very good. The tomb of Herod the Great. That's a good one. What did you study today? The dishonest steward from Luke chapter 16. All right. Very good. And Ryan is here to tell us what he's doing. Ryan? Today, our alleged Bible contradiction is found in the Gospels. And here's the question. Did the veil in the temple tear before Christ died, as Luke seems to record? Or did it tear afterwards, as Matthew and Mark seem to report? Also, we learn something fascinating through this whole parable and this whole thing of Jesus, what he said about money. We'll talk about that. Get your Bible guide and your Bible, and let's carry on, because it's time to study. There are a lot of really interesting historical and archaeological sites that date from the time period of the life of Jesus and his ministry, but they may or may not be, they may not always be mentioned in the New Testament Gospels. And today you and I are going to focus on one such place, the tomb of Herod the Great. Really, it's more like a city or a fortress. Take a look. In 28 BC, Herod the Great began preparing for his death. While he would not die for another 24 years, Herod wanted to create a fortress that would be a fitting monument to his great name, a place worthy to house his body after death. With an eye for the dramatic, Herod the Great chose a hill in the Judean desert, about 10 miles southeast of Bethlehem. There, he ordered that the hill be enlarged, thickened, and shaped into more of a cone. He also had a nearby hill shaved down, so it would appear diminished beside his city. Herod naturally named this architectural feat after himself, Herodium. On the top of his hill, he built a palace fortress surrounded by two walls that were crowned with four towers, one on each compass point. For the base of the mountain city, Herod ordered that it be raised off the valley floor several feet. Then he built another larger, more luxurious palace, which appears to have been where he spent most of his time. Once completed, Herodium would have been quite the contrast against its backdrop of Judean wilderness, a beacon of man-made glory complete with watered pools, colonnades, and colorful gardens, watered thanks to a six kilometer long aqueduct. Even the slope of the hill was not without its structures, a theater to seat three to four hundred people and a monumental stairway that led to a mausoleum. The question of exactly where Herod's burial place was within Herodium is still one of debate. Late archaeologist Ehud Netzer championed the research surrounding the so-called mausoleum found on the slope. In that area, Netzer also found the scattered remains of a red limestone sarcophagus. To him, this could be none other than Herod's casket, plundered, crushed, and scattered by disgruntled subjects after his death. To some, however, the monument on Herodium Slope does not seem to match Herod's over-the-top personality. While the monument was truly decadent, another theory places his final resting place in the highest tower on the summit of the mountain. You know, that's one of the interesting uh, aspects of this time period in history, this transition from the first century BC to the first century AD, where we see John the Baptist and Jesus Christ both being born and being raised. Uh, it, what's interesting is that Herod the Great, he wasn't just a mighty political figure. He did indeed take a lot of political risks, most of which paid off. They ultimately didn't for him as they drove him a little bit mad and he he lost it in the very end. But he was a builder king as well. And that was on purpose. He wanted to build something for himself that would last, not just a name that would go down his history as someone, you know, who was politically great, but he wanted to build monuments for himself so that uh, whenever someone would pass by, they would look at the temple and they would say, that's Herod's temple. Do you see the problem there? It's no longer a temple to God in Jerusalem. It becomes Herod's temple. 
temple. And it's the same thing here with Herodium. You know, this, this place still today, it looms over the landscape. And in some ways, Herod succeeded, didn't he? You know, we, we look at this uh, as, as lay people, as historians, as archaeologists, and we go, there's Herodium, the uh, very probable final resting place of Herod the Great, this great project. But it is still in ruins, isn't it? And that's the difference between what Herod the Great tried to do as king of Judea versus what Jesus Christ actually did as king of all. It cannot be done. No one anywhere at any time in their life can serve two masters. This is what the Bible says, and I believe the Bible. Today, there is no greater God to many than the God of mammon or money. It dictates what one does and how one lives. But Jesus Christ, who is God, spoke about this subject to his followers. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? If so, you must alter your opinion about money before becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. The parable of the unjust steward voices this precept well. A man serving money or mammon uses it to secure his future while not becoming a slave to it. God says about this man, quote, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light, chapter 16, verse 8. Luke 16, verses 1 through 13. He also said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. I have resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him, and said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? And so he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. So the master commended the unjust steward, because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, Make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. You cannot serve money. You've got to serve either God or money, but you can't serve both. And there's a lot of people in America and a lot of people in Canada, a lot of people in many parts of the world who have money. And that money is really, they really love it. But the problem is that if we serve money instead of God, then there's a major 
problem and conflict in our mind. And today, that's what we're going to talk about. It's very interesting. October Bible Guide, get it out because we're going to that. Get your Bible out, and it's very interesting. If you don't have your, your guide, then write to us at the addresses at the bottom of the screen. We'll be happy to send it to you, or go to www.biblediscoverytv.com and click on Donate here. Make a donation, and we'll be happy to send you the Bible Guide. Now, think about this. It's very important because as we enter into this teaching, really, serving God and serving mammon, really? That is not possible. God's going to deal with this. We read Luke chapter 15 to 16. Consider this. Consider that today you're going to learn something because I learn something every day. Luke chapter 16, 1 to 13. And as we focus on this scripture, I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit, guide us and direct us. Help us to know and understand exactly what you're teaching us. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 16, verses 1 to 8 say, He also said to his disciples, he's speaking to his disciples, There was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called his name and he said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account for your stewardship so you can no longer be steward. And then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my master is talking and the stewardship, taking the, the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. I have to resolve what to do that when I am put out the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him, every one of them. And he said to him, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said to him, well, a hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, take your bill, sit down and quickly write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. So the master commended, he commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly for the sons of this world. Listen to the statement. The sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. Jesus is talking about us and he's saying something interesting. Some in our world seem shrewder than many believers. Remember, this world operates on money. Now that's important to remember. A lot of people think that they can rule over their money and take their money and do things. But let me tell you something. You rule over your money, but actually your money's ruling you. And a lot of people think, well, that's okay. I'm going to rule something, so I get to rule God. And you try to take over God. That's not going to work either. God's going to, he's going to fix that. And let me tell you something, he can fix that. So we need to remember that you can't serve both masters. But we need to remember this world operates on money. So how are we to figure this out? Let's read on and find out. It says, and I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is, listen carefully, faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. What is Jesus saying? Jesus Christ says people who know how money works in this world understand much about the kingdom of how God works. Now, this is important. It's not that, you know, money is evil. That's not what we're saying. But what we're understanding is money can't be your Lord. Very important. Many people, they don't make this delineation, and they should. That it's not about, you know, pushing money aside or throwing money away. or That's not what it's about. In fact, uh, believers in Jesus Christ who have money they tend to be people who are very wise with it, and they tend to give things to God's work in tremendous ways. And we want to thank you for that because God has used you in an amazing way. So we need to remember that. Let's read on. Chapter 16, verse 11 says, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, if you've not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will commit your trust to the true riches? Wow. 
And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot, cannot serve God and mammon. You know, Jesus Christ says the way we command money shows how we think about the kingdom of God. We must seek the wisdom of Christ for the things we do on earth. You know, Christ blesses us when we do right and we run our businesses according to the principles of God. Let me tell you what God does. He blesses us. Praise God. Hallelujah. But we recognize that it's his business and it's his money. And we operate by praying and asking him to show us and by reading the Bible and understanding the word of God. And then we can give to ministries or churches or projects because God has blessed us, beloved. That, that's how that works. You see, most of the people who have poverty issues or money problems, in fact, I like to say it this way. Most of the people who have money problems, that's, that's what they have, money problems. And they are people who do not understand that it's not the money, it's them. Because most of the people who have money problems don't have money. See, when we think this through, we need to understand that. We need to realize that, that God is, is the one who is in control. And there, there will be people listening right now, watching television right now who, who need to understand this and they need to recognize this. And Father, I pray for those individuals and I, I ask in Jesus' name, and I am not a rich man, I ask in Jesus' name that you would help those people to understand what it is that you've called them to do. Help them to understand that you are God in Jesus' name. And, and, and if, you, if you don't understand who God is, pray to Jesus Christ and say to him, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I'm a sinful man and I need to be forgiven of my sin. I need the gift of eternal life. Come and do that today, Lord Jesus. I, I am completely under your control. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Next time on Quick Study Television, we're going to talk about how many times we forgive someone because Jesus Christ talked about it. We'll listen to what he said. Very interesting stuff. So join us next time on Quick Study. Right now, here's Ryan. Well, today we have a really interesting apparent Bible contradiction, and here it is. Did Christ's death occur before the temple veil was torn, as Matthew and Mark seem to report? Or did Christ die after the veil was torn, as Luke seemingly reports? For thousands of years, skeptics have attacked the Bible, claiming that it contains many contradictions and errors. Especially attacked are the Gospels of Jesus Christ. For example, critics say that there is disagreement among the Gospels over the timing of the tearing of the temple veil. In Matthew 27 we read, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Mark records in chapter 15, And Jesus cried out with a loud voice, and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And Luke proclaims in chapter 23, 
Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So here we see in these parallel accounts the apparent contradiction. While Matthew and Mark seem to place the timing of Christ's death before the veil was torn, Luke seemingly places his death afterward. So when was the veil torn? Did it tear before Jesus' death or after? In fact, it happened neither before or after, but at the very same moment Christ died. Indeed, in examining the original Greek, we discover that the word translated in some Bibles as then is actually a conjunction which can have a copulative or cumulative force, meaning that this word can be used to join together two words or groups of words, and it can also be used when the writer wants to build one idea upon another. The word is often translated as and, also, even, both, then, so, or likewise. It is those versions of the Bible which translate this word as then, which seem to imply that one event happened and then another. However, versions of the Bible which render that same word as and reinforce the idea that Christ's death and the tearing of the temple veil took place at the same time. So there is no contradiction here, because the temple veil tore at the exact moment Christ died, not before or after. But the confusion comes when some of the English translations make it seem like one event is happening and then the other, when in reality these events happened simultaneously. Luke simply chose to mention the tearing of the veil first, while Matthew and Mark mentioned it second. That's totally acceptable. Now, Hebrews chapter 6 also supports these events as occurring at the same time. Here the writer explains that Jesus Christ has gone behind the veil for us to become our high priest. The tearing of the temple veil signified the start of Christ's ministry as high priest. Therefore, to access God, we no longer need to go through a human priest, but through Jesus Christ. You know, a lot of times the Gospels say things that look like they're different, but they're really not. They're the same. And this is a very interesting study. Thank you, Ryan, for that. The, the temple veil tore at the same time Jesus Christ was crucified. And this is something we need to remember, that there were a lot of things happening, but when they reported on it, you know, the darkness in the land, the temple veil, the crying out, all that stuff happened at the same time. I don't know how you put that in to make it right. But uh, Ryan, he says that uh, these these are consistent in the Gospels, and we need right. to be serious about this. Right. Well, what we have to remember about the Gospels is that they're not they're not. Tr we have to look at them for what they are and what they intended to be. And they're not trying to be exhaustive histories of everything that went on. You know, the, the closest that we get is Luke, but he's already aware of what Mark has said when he's writing, uh, more than likely. Um, in, in just the nature of a gospel and the nature of how difficult it was to write something extremely long, and the fact that the gospels were uh, written to be read aloud, you know, they're, they're like a movie clip of sorts. They edit things out. It's not the director's cut. It's not the full yeah. length feature. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, and, and so, and, you know, so it refers to histories and it refers to different events, but uh, they can't all spare the time to get into every single detail. So that's just the nature of historical writing and the nature of what a gospel was meant to be. Yeah, so, that's right. We, can't, we have to be careful not to apply a standard to the Gospels that was never meant to be applied. Yeah. We can't make up something that they were supposed to be and then go, why aren't you that? <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right. We tend to be. read into the Scripture. <laughs> exegesis, it's called exegesis, yeah. is reading from the Scripture to change me. Iegesis is, re is me reading into the Scripture what I want it to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we can't do that. No. That's a violation. We have to approach, we have to approach, you know, and that goes with any historical book, any book today. Yeah. You have to approach it the way it is meant to be approached. Yeah, that's just that's respect. Right. <laughs> what did you study? Well, before I go into that, I do want to mention to our viewers, our Quick Study family, that this is your second last day of, of taping with us. Now, the it air is. date for this program is October the 18th. And so it is very probable that for yes. sure by this, yes, time, by this time, your baby boy will be here and mm -hmm. we will be 
very joyful, and we will let you know as soon as this happens, but we're taping on actual September the 14th. Yes. So we've got one more taping day, and then you're going to be going on maternity leave for a I little am. while, mm -hmm. but you will be joining us back again. Coming well. back. Coming back in the new year, and you'll come for a visit, right? Of and course. bring the baby so of that course. we can all meet him on the yes. air. And we're going to Great. have your features recorded so that we can play them and, yes. and use them. Yes, my segments so. will still be yes. in the program, That's so right. I just won't be here at the table with you guys. That's yeah. right. So right. you've so. got a lot of preparation to uh, still have the segments ready for us and we'll just try to wrap around those as best we can until you come back. So just wanted to let you know that she won't be here for a little while, but she's going to be coming back. Mm -hmm. Now, the dishonest steward from Luke chapter 16, a rich man would often employ a manager or a steward who would handle all the business affairs of his estate. Now we find out at the beginning of this chapter in 16 that this man had accusations brought against him. And so we're not sure whether what he was doing was just bad management or whether he was doing something illegal, whether he was taking money. We don't really know. But what we can surmise from this was that he was doing something wrong. Because when the, the owner or when the rich man brought the accusations against him, he didn't defend himself. What he did was go to the people that owed the rich man money or his, uh, the, the, his employer mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, to try to work out a deal because he was afraid. He, he admitted himself here, he says in verse 3, I cannot dig. So he wasn't good with his hands. He wasn't a laborer. And I'm ashamed to beg. So he tried to make a way. But uh, the landowner also wanted an accounting of the record of his assets. And so this, I'm assuming, was more so that when he hired a new steward, right. he would have the plans already done of what his assets were. Yeah. So uh, a rather a complicated it is. story. It's, it's a complicated story, but at the same time, it's a good story. Because Jesus Christ used this and explained to people, you know, this is how you need to consider this. How, how He said the sons of light don't have this kind of knowledge. And he tells us these things. Very, very important. Thank you. That is absolutely true. And as we continue in studying through the Bible, let me just say that your gifts are very much appreciated. We very much appreciate your gifts. We pray and ask the Lord to uh, talk to you when you pray about what to give and how to give and all that. We don't tell you how much, but just pray about it and God will speak to you.